<laughs> Remember that, guys. Again, retweet it from Ross. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, no, there's a certain amount of just kind of belief that something will be there when it gets That's the positive way of phrasing it. Um, we were tech people learning a heck of a lot. And just um, when we went through Y Combinator last year, day one of Y Combinator, AR Kit came out. So that was like uh, one of these moments where Tim Cook is up on stage and his demo looks a lot like your demo. And it was <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> so it's either one. really great validation or going, oh crap. Uh, it was like, oh crap, and then the validation part. Right, so okay. then you're just like going there. So probably 24 hours after ARKit came out, it was probably us and Google that had like decompiled it to the extent that you could wow. and like figured out which was possible. And then from there it was, uh, once, once we calmed down after like figuring it all out, then uh, it was essentially a rocket ship up from there because the market was validated, everyone was coming in there, it was a lot easier to find customers. We did our fundraising round in 10 days, which for a lot of startups it usually a more wow. arduous process. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it was the AR cloud buzzword kind of began to come up in the fall of last year, so about a year ago now. And then it was just kind of we had people calling us at like two o'clock in the morning saying, "Hey, I heard you solved AR." And then uh, <laughs> solved <laughs> AR. What was your response to that? Actually, well, it was like two in the morning. And oh, okay. Just, like, yeah, this is versus Steve. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I only respond to Steve at 2 a.m. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so then it was like, is this one of my friends playing crazy? And then you like, yeah. realize, like, no, this is someone from Europe. And you're like, oh, I'm being billed for this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then that was when we had to remove our phone numbers from the email numbers. Uh, okay, that was less than 10 in startup life. <laughs> well, it's one of these, like, wonderful uh, experiences that everyone always dreams of, like, oh, when all the customers are rushing, they want to talk mm -hmm. to you and everything else. It's like one of these things that every entrepreneur should dream. So when you're in the middle of it, it's stressful. Because then you're like, oh my god, we need to get this out, like kind of juggling things. And then meanwhile, and Niantic's like, hey, you should come into me. And they're like, well, they're 99% of the market we're going to. Like, you should probably take that meeting. And, uh, I mean, those guys kind of created that that category. That was like the art market. Yeah, yeah no. So Arguably <laughs> still is, actually. <laughs> Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but mm -hmm. we are by far the majority of the market. And right, yeah. It's uh, yeah, it's been a hell of a ride since then. So you think that the, mm -hmm. kind of, you're in my and you're like, oh, this is a rocket ship. And then uh, right. you're like, venture capital funding, you're like, oh, there's another rocket under there. And now you have like an antic sized rocket underneath the cloud. And you're just like, <laughs> yeah. oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I mean, the entire time you're just like holding on, basically, and being shot up. Learning a lot is just really amazing when you can see stuff happen so quickly. Um, and then you begin to appreciate how fast, like, or you can understand why hypergrowth companies are called hypergrowth, right. mm -hmm. um, and then all the dynamics associated with it. So it's been like a really amazing learning experience. And you know, just the, I, I remember the range of problems that we had like even just a year ago. Right. Um, today, wow, I have learned a lot. And every moment, you're like, oh, I need to. Right. So, what are I mean? I guess like whatever you can share, basically. Is there anything like you know, really pivotal that you learned in the past year that you've been with Niantic? Um, probably the main thing for like the augmented reality crowd here. Um, we were initially a company that was building, or Escher was a company building tech for tech's sake. Um, and it, like a lot of the augmented reality community kind of came from the Google culture, either directly or indirectly. Like Google has. Kind hey, I need a cool tech thing style mm -hmm. culture. Um, thinking about the AR space is not, hey, how can we get AR into the market? It is what applications and what experiences are actually better from augmented reality. So like, I don't, or my thinking has completely changed from focusing on what is, how do we get this technology, what are the applications of it to, okay, here's what we want to do. Is AR good for this or not? Because like an example I gave, Ago was the first apps in the AR kit was tic tac toe. Oh, and you, you, just, you don't need AR to play tic tac toe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you need a piece of paper and some yeah, pen. Yeah, yeah. It's so, like, does this really make it better? And sure. like, I mean, yeah. it was one of the first experiences out there that popular, so like, that's mm -hmm. great for an early thing, but, right. but it's this novelty effect as well, right? I mean, is that engagement going in just because people go, hey, I can actually do this in AR? I, how many people here have played tic tac toe in AR? 
Okay, we got one. Okay, here we go. That was not the air kit, though. That was uh, with AR Core when it comes to that. They have their own thing back as well. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. We'll, we'll still count that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but no, just for all of you working on mixed reality, think about the application and think does AR actually make this better? Um, and that can guide for the technologists here, guide the technology that you want to develop if you think from an application standpoint. And if you are building the applications, then you can think about what you want and then how can you like, cheat and make, make ways or make the technology work for you in a way and not just say, oh, I want to like do multiplayer uh, tic tac toe. And mm -hmm. it's like, oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, apologies to the person who uh, <laughs> actually did that. It was just like one of the first videos that got over 10,000 views. Uh, oh, really? Was it? Okay. This was like June of uh, last year. Oh, I got it basically at, it, at the height, basically. Yeah, yeah. So it was like Apple just came out and someone's like, oh, I'm doing tic tac toe. And then like, BuzzFeed took it up and then it, it went from there. But uh, got it, know, got it. Applications, very important. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I'm kind of curious. I mean, what does a lead researcher at Niantic do? What's a you know, day in the life of Ross Pinder at Niantic? Uh, well, Aside from flying to various different places in the world, <laughs> which you do quite a bit often, too. Yeah, so, um, so there's kind of two different aspects of what I focus on at Niantic. One is kind of focusing and building up the kind of future teams. Mm -hmm. um, so then that's kind of what are the problems that we're going to run into down the line, not necessarily like what is the day-to-day -day, like on um, interface and what is the API layer, but just what are the problems that we need to be building up in the future. Because my background is very much rooted in the kind of academic technology associated with it, but then you know, over the last two and a half years, I've like business and applications that I've been into me, willingly or not. Um, <laughs> so then being able to connect those two Here's something that I think that we can do with technology, um, and then how do you get the technology teams up for that? So, like one aspect is building out those teams, writing uh, some, of the, some of the goals associated with that. I can't be too specific about that, mm -hmm. um, yeah. but uh, we're working on some pretty cool stuff internally. Um, and then also you know, talking to a lot of people, trying to raise the AR tide. of the market, if not the market. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, and then if we, like that is something that we want to change and not, like we want there to be like more data points out there and helping out other people, um, not just from a technology standpoint, but just from the company standpoint. Like we are one of the pillars in augmented reality right now. And the more that we can help out others and kind of grow the market, then maybe we'll have a smaller slice, but a one of the main things that I really kind of value in part of my No, definitely. And I and I think Ross, you've definitely been a kind of an active champion in the community as well. I mean, basically helping out with let's say the MIT hackathons and stuff. So Ross basically told me that, you know, as grand prize or one of the prizes for the MIT hackathon, was it around AR and C V? Yeah, so okay. the augment, Niantic Augmented Reality Prize. Right, yeah. So the the prize that uh, Ross brought to the table was this ginormous Pikachu. How big was it? <laughs> uh, so there was also a $4,000 prize. But okay, <laughs> that too. That, you know, that's a gigantic Pikachu. Yeah. And then what, got, what got all the college students really excited was an eight foot tall Pikachu. Oh my that, yes, there you go. <laughs> Try to fit that in so, your room. <laughs> um, and so then the teams were of four people, but we only gave up one Pikachu. So it's kind of a Hunger oh. Games style moment. Uh -huh. right the couch, okay. <laughs> where you're just like, okay, only one of you gets it. And then you, they all kind of look at each other and you just like walk away. <laughs> right. Well, we'll definitely get to uh, get to talk more about how you see the AR tide rising. But uh, before we uh, can I end this fireside chat with you, is um, so last time we met, you were talking about your blog post about uh, the cotton candy startup. Can you give us an abstract? I mean, how's that blog post going actually? Are you still? Uh, okay, there's a lot of traveling. So okay, I know. <laughs> okay, so yeah, <laughs> Shane really liked this. Uh, so one of these, uh, or one of the questions that I'm always asked whenever I go back to the East Coast is what's the difference between the East Coast and the West Coast um, in terms of startups, um, having like done both. So one of the main things is a Boston company will, like if everyone
everything makes sense and the whole market is all aligned, then they'll go after something. So it's like step one, step two, step three, and here's how we get to $2 billion. It all logically makes sense. At that time, a uh, cotton candy company has already been like in that direction for two years. So I don't mean this in an entirely pejorative way, but there's a lot of people kind of that take a little grain of like sugar of content, and then they add a bunch of hot air and spin. Oof, it can take up a lot of volume. <laughs> it's very sweet to taste, but it's not fulfilling. If you drop a water, it rains and it disappears. Um, so there's a there's a strong culture of that in the startup space. Now that's people like it's a it's a little tongue in cheek uh, reference, but it's also you know, people that are pushing for more and imagining what more it can be. So like we think about technology takes a while to develop, um, so you need to keep adding. Like all, all anyone can ever do is like little grains. Said the same thing here in, a, in front of a, some audience, right? And then people are like, mm. <laughs> hitting too close to home. <laughs> yeah. No comment. Yeah. <laughs> wise, wise words, actually. There you go. Well, uh, yeah, well, we're going to bring you back on in a couple of minutes as well. So that's for us, guys. <laughs> so we have uh, Miroslav uh, Lysik. Uh, who is current product manager at uh, Sansura, which is a, they focus on enterprise IoT solutions and integration, and we'll definitely get into that a bit. Uh, but actually most recently, just actually last month, or maybe two months ago, right? Uh, Miroslav was a product management lead for Mapbox's AR um, uh, team. And this is actually how I met Miroslav in the first place, actually last year at an upload uh, SF kind of lunch and learn, right, around AR. This was when, ARKit was uh, first launched, ARKit and AirCourt to see the market. So really exciting times. Um, and prior to uh, Mapbox, Miroslav has actually had a quite an interesting journey getting it actually into product management too. Because I think he started with uh, anthropology and international studies at the University of Chicago, and then took on various different roles from strategy to market analysis to UX uh, and consulting, and then made your way from I guess, uh, is there a silicon, I guess, like term for Chicago or not really? Uh, that's a great question. Austin has Silicon Hills, which we're right. talking about. I don't yeah, think yeah. Chicago's gotten to that level yet. Okay, <laughs> got it, got it. So, actually, I mean, let's, uh, this is a good segue into, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about your background and your journey, essentially, you know, from Chicago to Silicon Hills and Austin now to Silicon Valley in San Francisco? Yeah, it's so. nice hearing my background recap by somebody else. <laughs> 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 right. Hopefully, I did a justification for it. No, it's good. Yeah. No, I started with an anthropology degree and ultimately decided that I wasn't going to go in the direction of academia because okay. I was in the liberal arts, not in uh, <laughs> robotics, <laughs> yep. like Ross. Um, uh, and so my decision was to go into consulting because that would be a good way to transition into a mix of data analysis, thinking about strategy, right. um, and so forth. Um, but uh, I jumped into that and that wasn't in the tech space. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I realized the, the, the test space was somewhere that I wanted to be, ultimately end up in San Francisco here. Um, and so in uh, Chicago, this is in uh, around 2011, 2012, yeah. we had our first incubator open up uh, called okay. 1871. Um, and that ended up being a really important space for the Chicago tech community to get together um, and also learn from one another and do educational programs and so forth. Uh, and so that got me on my direction in terms of doing design and so forth. Yeah, and you mentioned you were, you were I guess, like learning on the side on your weekends with uh, the UX stuff. I mean, what, what kind of resources do you use and you know, how long did it take you to, I guess, like, you feel comfortable enough to just, like, you know, apply it? Uh, it's a lot of uh, fake it till you make it. Okay, um, yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's that's sort of like, guys. <laughs> so so I, I did a, a, a nights and weekends design program there. Yeah. Um, 
about 11 weeks, mm -hmm. and what it did for me was it gave me the terminology, right, the design space yeah. um, that, that coupled nicely with my anthropology background and the mm -hmm. strategy work that I was doing. So that I could approach other startups and essentially offer my my uh, consulting services, sure. which are yeah. free, uh, <laughs> and and use that as an opportunity to build up a portfolio and, <laughs> and get exposed to common common situations. Got it. Right. Uh, so, and so leveraging that, yeah. um, got the first startup job that I had. Um, and this was uh, think that for no. So this was uh, this was around the time of uh, unseen or, or yik yak and secret. If, okay. if you remember those mm -hmm. uh, anonymous uh, social media apps. Yep. Uh, so there was one in Austin uh, that got started called Unseen. Uh, yeah. and it was sort of like an anonymous uh, right. uh, Instagram for colleges. Okay. Um, and all these apps were trying to cut out a sliver of the market right. um, yeah. between Snapchat and Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was where I jumped into my first startup experience. I see. Yeah. And what was the transition like between that and uh, ThinkDev? So ThinkDev, uh, ThinkDev is interesting. So ThinkDev, for those that don't know, is uh, innovation consultancy out of Austin. Um, they've been around in this space in Austin as the tech scene has grown over the years. Um, and the startup I was working for was actually a client of theirs. Oh, okay. um, and so we had worked with them, and I really liked the team at ThinkDev ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, and so they actually ended up approaching me. Right. I hopped in, and the reason I hopped in was because they worked with a lot of different startups. And so this was a good opportunity to uh, get exposed to an executive coming to you and right. they have an idea or they're already running a company but it's not doing too well mm -hmm. and you go through the process of figuring out whether they're doing something wrong from the product standpoint from the marketing standpoint mm -hmm. um, and helping them fix that and so that was for me a training ground interesting uh, okay lots of different businesses um, but lots of common mistakes right and um, how did you I guess um, go into uh, Mapbox I mean because right now I mean at this point you were at uh, Austin right kind yeah of well, so uh, um, this is an important thing for me. So ThinkDiv was a, a great environment to get exposed to a lot of ideas, but I also had a very supportive boss. And mm -hmm. so I approached him and told him that I was going to leave the company and move to San Francisco. Oh, okay. And he yeah. counter-proposed with an offer for me to come <laughs> to San Francisco and try to build a business here. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. And so um, I came out to SF, uh, started to hustle as much as I could, yep. and eventually found our first client, which was uh, in the SF uh, market, which was in the autonomous vehicle space. Mm -hmm. um, and so this was a company that is creating the localization technology for self-driving cars, as well as the high-definition maps. Mm -hmm. um, and for those of you that, that know the space a little bit, it's sort of two sides of the same coin with AR. That's right. Um, where you need high definition maps of the world for a self driving car to navigate, you also need high definition maps of the world for an, a real believable AR experience. Right. Um, and so for me, transitioning to Mapbox was realizing that this cartography space is changing a lot. Your your 2D navigation experience yeah. is is maps the old way, if you will. Mm -hmm. And there's this world where the idea of a map relies much more on much more high definition data about the world around you. So joining the Mapbox AR team was an opportunity right. to help the company figure out how to take its data powering developer mm -hmm. tools for 2D maps and bringing that into the AR context. No, oh, definitely. And it was actually a really good time too, right? Because I think this was when Mapbox had just secured the SoftBank funding of mm -hmm. 160 mil. Mm -hmm. Definitely <laughs> no joke right there. And right. they had started basically the, the AR team, actually. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that was actually an excellent time to No, absolutely. Do one of those things where whether you're uh, making a career move or trying to start a company, uh, yeah. right time, right place. And so this is a good opportunity to help this company figure out how to mm -hmm. enter this new market that's developing on its own as well. Right, uh, yeah. Which is a, for those of you that are interested in AR or the space in general and interested in entering in space, um, it's this unique opportunity to kind of move with the market as it's developing. And it's very different than trying to introduce a product into a very developed space. That's uh, right. And we'll probably get into it on the panel, but no, for we sure, we'll definitely. see to that. Yeah, and I mean, I want to fast forward to today, right? Because he had just joined uh, Samsara. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us more about what the company does? Which is, by the way, worth 1.4 billion uh, today, right? They're definitely tackling something that a lot of companies are not. So maybe you can tell us more about the company, what you do, and you know, why did you uh, make that transition? Yeah, so um, Mapbox is a, is a company focused on developer tools, and yep. so the AR products were around helping developers create AR mm -hmm. uh, experiences. 
Um, transitioning to Sansar, which focuses on uh, IoT sensors, was interesting for me because it's a company that's uh, entering a space that has largely been kind of overlooked by Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. which is introducing sensors for uh, fleet management. Right. And one of the interesting things that happened with the company is that they introduced cameras, which are an open-ended sensor. Um, and so you have this opportunity to lever, leverage computer vision and AR in spaces um, that, that, that there's true value to be found right now, right. Um, which you know, is important in the AR space. And Ross kind of hit on this, where um, the, the market is new and you don't want to be a cotton candy, you want to kind of find, yeah. <laughs> uh, you want to find the grains of sugar in the market that are sweet, and so I- It's gonna be hashtag cotton candy, by the way. Right. <laughs> it's gonna be the same, I promise you, after today, yeah. So, <laughs> I think they actually finished the blog. <laughs> <laughs> we should, we're still waiting for it. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so for me, Samsara is a company that's in an interesting space there. Sorry, uh, what's the open-ended sensor for those? Yeah, the, you can hashtag that term for okay. the uh, So the interesting thing about cameras is that you can train them to see or learn various different things. Um, and so in the case of Samsara, you have these companies that install dash cams or cameras on their products or security right. cameras, and they have various different needs that you can quickly deploy to the cameras. Yeah. And you add that on top of another data platform or the rest of the sensor data platform, mm -hmm. and you start to have an interesting IoT play. Got it, got it, okay. Um, and actually, I mean, uh, switching gears a little bit, yeah. and this is a question that I'm always fascinated with uh, with product managers, which is, what do you think is your product management or product philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. Because given your background and also the various different roles, what's your philosophy and how has that manifested in you know, the products that you've helped or the teams that you've helped manage? Yeah, there's a... Uh, that's a good question. There's a series of them. Um, I would start with uh, a common one you hear, but it's actually hard to do, which is uh, customer obsession or customer right. empathy. Mm -hmm. and it's actually really important in the AR space, and, and yeah. Ross did a hit on this as well. Mm -hmm. um, spending a lot of time with your customers and truly right. understanding their pain points mm -hmm. and whether you're actually providing value. Um, the second yeah. one relates to that is shift fast. Um, because, oh, shift fast, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a saying, um, if if you're not embarrassed by your product, then, <laughs> then you've waited too long. Ooh, boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, in a sense, um, you know, if you're running your product like a business owner, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is kind of the third uh, the principle, you want to try to follow revenue as much as possible. Right. Um, and that means understanding the real value that you're providing and actually selling the thing and selling it soon if you can. Got it. Um, but I'll hit on the last one, okay. which is uh, a beautiful product is important too. A beautiful um, product. Okay. Yeah, and, and what I mean by that is, um, oftentimes you can get caught up in trying to ship fast mm -hmm. and uh, you know catch up with the market, and, yeah. and especially developer-heavy companies, for example, mm -hmm. um, you you tack on too many things and you stop. You, you don't stop to think about how you can make the thing and the experience beautiful for the end users. Right. Um, yeah. Both from an ethical standpoint and a good experience standpoint. Great, thank you so much for that. And actually, please stay in your seat because I'm gonna move over one so that Ross can join the middle. There we go. Uh, roll out of your way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so now, Open up the gates. Go. I'm gonna put on this uh, <laughs> mic as well. So. So. I'm really glad you brought up the llama farms. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna bring that in last. Uh, I swear everyone will like not remember any of the robotic <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Sure, it'll just be like, oh, the llama guy. The llama guy, exactly from Idaho. There we go. <laughs> yep. All right. So um, now that we have both of you guys on, actually, is this me on test test? It's very strange that I need to tell all the Silicon Valley people we should be more cultured and accepting of people from Idaho. <laughs> 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 this should not be a shock. <laughs> we'll continue. Yes. Okay. There we go. Um, moving away from llamas, actually. Um, into more augmented reality, which is what everybody's here for. So a lot of things have happened since actually the first time that I met uh, Miroslav last year, right? Because the tools are out. Um, Escher basically also kind of spearheaded the AR cloud. It became a thing, and Niantic is still, I guess some things have not changed, right? So what do you think in the past year in the field of AR has been like the most important? Maybe the top one, two, two or three. I'll start. Um, so I'd say that, uh, well, obviously our kit came out last summer, um, and that galvanized the market. It helped your business, um, you know, get attention, and it was important validation for the market. 
Um, the, the thing is that the early experiences were very much tabletop based and very simple. So, um, hey, I can drop this thing on my table one. There you go. Um, and there are only so many experiences that you can build around that. And some great examples of that are like Ikea's app where you can drop furniture in the room around you. That's actually useful. Um, uh, the next thing though is the question of persistence. Um, so, um, you know, I can drop something on the table, but if somebody else uh, takes out their phone, they can't necessarily see that thing in the, in the room next to me. Um, and then you can keep ratcheting that up in, in terms of levels of complexity. Um, and so ARKit, uh, Google release solutions, Escher was working in the space, which we'll touch on. Uh, but the, that was kind of the next step in this direction of the quote unquote AR cloud. Right. Um, and so those two things, and then I'll, the last thing I'll say is, um, I think Magic Leap was also interesting coming right, out. Yeah. Um, it was uh, uh, something long awaited in the AR glasses space. Um, and in my personal experience of putting on the headset after trying a lot of different headsets was that um, it was a substantial step forward in terms of a really immersive and impactful experience. Um, and I think the conversations that it sparked were really interesting for, for, for kind of helping think about what we need to do in AR right now.
So actually related to that, I mean, speaking of unsung heroes, maybe we can actually give some of these guys some highlights, right? So during your journeys and also Miroslav's journey, I mean, basically Mapbox is a developer platform, right? Yeah. What are some of the like, you know, really cool experiences or I, I hate the term killer apps, by the way, because everybody uses it and it's like, it's a discovery phase as well, right? So right now it's like basically cool applications and then trying to figure out what is actually really gonna stick. But let's stick with the cool layer for now, right? Um, what are some really awesome kind of experiences or AR type of apps that you guys have seen during your journey? So just to start it off on, I really, so to, to put a framework around this, I view that there are two main uh, use case, or two main things that are different about AR in a mobile context. One is the position of the device matters. The second is the real world becomes content. Um, and there's kind of interesting dynamics that Probably one of the coolest applications that I've seen from a just like this was novel and I never thought about it before was this one company out of uh, Finland that they did a mini golf game with AR kit where you could hold the phone down here and swing your arms. So while everyone's complaining about like, oh, I can't hold my hand up here for more than right. five minutes, you can like swing your arms and putt around mm -hmm. in your area. Sounds like a Wii Sports type of uh, yeah. dynamic. And like, I was like, when we saw it, it was like, this just makes sense. And you're like, wow, I can do that for hours. I mean, So are they actually using the phone as the... Yeah, the AR okay. kit tracking system, oh, which is actually oh, okay. through. So you actually yeah, see yeah. the putter, and then you can see the ball that needs to go through a mini, okay. uh, mini golf game. So how are you actually holding the phone? Are you looking at the screen while you're doing yeah, it? Yeah, you're or holding it like a okay. putter. It's like a wide putter. Ah, and okay. It's kind of like swinging your arms that way. And got it, got it. work on your forearms, it has everything's art. Oh, that's like, fascinating. Okay. Yeah, no, it's like, right. like when you try it out, it's like, yeah, wow, this it's works. Really natural. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Everyone's like, oh, like, kind of after five minutes, yeah, yeah. But, so that I thought was just it was clever, like mm -hmm. it, using like, the existing limitations of the of the hardware too. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then uh, so it's like things like that where I, like, I can all but guarantee you, like no one has thought more about AR <laughs> <laughs> and like from the deep technology and like exploring the application space. Yeah. Um, but then the second aspect is what I'm most excited about longer term, and there's some applications that I've seen with this, thinking of the real world as content. Mm -hmm. um, so that means it's like either game dynamics or experiences that change based off. So what we were developing at Escher was a demo where color is a resource um, in, in the game. So then if you, you could mine the color of the world, it would actually look like you're sucking the color out mm -hmm. like a red chair. Um, and then you could have like red blimps that would go around and you could pack the blue blimps. And then, right. So the balancing aspect in the game would all change based off the location, based off mm -hmm. of the colors of your room. Yeah. So then if you project that forward, like what are all the things in the world that could be content that you can like interact with mm -hmm. and play with? This is just talking about the colors, but that that's one example, but that idea, I love that idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. It's interesting, I, I, I agree with those, and so having worked at Mapbox and, and working on developer tools, um, a lot of my job was spending time talking to as many developers as possible to see what they're trying to build, what they're, what's missing, uh, what are they able to achieve, and I would say the unselling heroes, I like, I like that question. Yeah. Um, are people like uh, like uh, the city of Cupertino wants to build an AR visualization experience to show uh, like a new structure they want to build, or uh, uh, in the same vein, uh, I talked to uh, another municipality that wanted to visualize the pipes in the city under the ground. Uh, there's somebody I talked to that uh, was working on trying to create a different type of film experience where the world around you becomes the set. Um, so sort of speaking to, you know, you were talking about colors being pulled away, but this is putting colors or different experiences in the world around you. Um, the catch though is that uh, in, in the space, localization is that big thing that needs to get solved for, for the floodgates to open. Um, yeah. And so, you know, what you see today is, um, you know, uh, a, a smaller bite version of this. Um, so it's, it's smaller games that people are playing around with and in the process of creating these games, they're actually discovering the things that people like Mapbox and, and so forth need to build yeah. um, to get us to kind of where we want to be. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the catch 22. It's like, it's, and, and so magically, but I think got a little bit of heat for this to some extent, which is like, how do you balance play and, and open-ended creation and having a very clear idea of what you want to build immediately right now. Right. Um, and so you kind of have to 
balance the two in a new space. And actually, mate, uh, Ross, when you're talking about kind of like the second type of air experiences with kind of actually the contextual in nature as well, that's something that Mapbox definitely kind of pay attention to also, right? With the whole POI mm -hmm. kind of database. Because I remember seeing one of the demos, or maybe Miroslav, you were talking about it, where you're walking down the street and maybe like because it's a restaurant, a chef comes out or something, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than a, a gym buff guy coming out of crunch or something. Yeah, so one of the things, uh, uh, one inspiration for us uh, at Netbox um, is the idea of providing data for developers to then create world scale experiences that are contextual, much the same way that Pokemon Go reacts to where you are. And it's this similar idea of the AR experience being contextual and relevant to you somewhere in the world. Um, Hot Stepper is an app that you can download. Right. It has a character that guides you in AR, and any time it passes by, it's something like a barber shop, and the character's hair changes. And so it's this interplay of, of the digital world with the physical world is what everybody's trying to scratch at, mm -hmm. um, and is, I think, the most exciting thing about AR. Yeah, definitely. And actually, for, hop, for those in the room who have not heard of or seen Hostepper, it's pretty amusing. So basically, <laughs> the chef's hat or whatever he wears is just about the only thing he wears. Yeah. It's a half-naked dude, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's guiding you to your next destination. So pretty entertaining, actually. One Works of the, for marketing. The, it totally, the it totally does. The agency built it got a lot of attention. <laughs> definitely, right? So um, we're not judging at all. <laughs> definitely not. Whatever gets the attention, right? So and uh, Ross, I mean, I, I I hear I keep on hearing the the term the AR tide, essentially. You know, rising. You want the AR tide to rise. What do you guys think will what will it take? actually, for, for it to rise? I mean, first of all, what, what, what would that look like? Uh, at least in terms of what it would look like is, I mean, that kind of Niantic not having a majority of the market by the way, which, <laughs> <laughs> so like mm -hmm. from a more practical context, right. on, as I said, like kind of having 60% of the bigger pie is the ideal, is more and more people are developing. So I view 